good evening. It's uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome so many, I believe probably mostly first and second year, but some third year uh, medical students to the Boston University School of Medicine for this otolaryngology forum and networking event. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Groloni. I'm the chair of the department here at Boston University. Tonight, you're going to hear firsthand about our specialty and have the opportunity to ask questions and talk directly to residents and practicing physicians. This is a unique opportunity to gain information that will help you as you consider a career in otolaryngology. The panel will cover the different types of conditions that otolaryngologists treat, the differences between private and academic practice settings, work-life balance, the trade-offs between specialization and general practice, your role in, in the patient care team, and of course, the match process and the journey through residency and fellowship. We have assembled a, a wonderful and diverse uh, panel here this evening uh, to be moderated by Dr. Greg Randolph, who I'll introduce in just a minute. But first, I want to thank the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery for their commitment to expanding the outreach events like this one and for providing important resources to medical students. Their new student program was the brainchild of Dr. James Denaney, who is the uh, executive uh, vice president and chief executive officer of the academy with full support and enthusiasm from the full membership. Just last week, the academy's new student website launched with articles, surgical videos, and additional resources available to any student considering a career in our specialty. Before we begin, I would also like to thank our otolaryngology student interest group here at Boston University School of Medicine for all of their hard work in putting this event together. You know, people kept emailing me over the last few weeks and thanking me for organizing this, and I had to email them back and say, you know, I didn't really have a lot to do with this. It was all of the students. So I'm going to ask uh, Alex. I know Alex is here somewhere because I was just talking to him. Alex, can you stand up? Stand up, <laughs> Alex. So this is Alex Valentine, <laughs> Anthony Chung. Anthony, stand up. <laughs> Alina Rezac. Alina, stand up. And, and Zarub Jalil. And by the way, I should mention the two of them, Anthony and Zarub, won awards at our recent uh, BU. Uh, student research um, symposium. So congratulations on that too. And all of this was not without help from our Director of Medical Student Education, uh, Jess Levy. <laughs> Jess is a faculty member in our department. She's our pediatric otolaryngologist. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening. Dr. Greg Randolph is the Division Chief of General Otolaryngology and thyroid and parathyroid surgery at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, as well as a full professor of otolaryngology and the Claire and John Bertucci Endowed Chair in Thyroid Surgical Oncology at Harvard Medical School. He has also served as a president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery back just a few years ago in 2016. Dr. Randolph received his otolaryngology and surgical training at Cornell University and Harvard Medical School. He has focused the bulk of his research on recurrent laryngeal nerve anatomy, preservation, and monitoring during thyroid cancer surgery, and has over 150 peer-reviewed publications. He has led thyroid surgical missions in St. Petersburg, Russia, Guangzhou, China, Kenya, rural India, and in the Chernobyl region of the Ukraine. He founded and directs the Harvard Thyroid and Parathyroid Surgery course for surgeons and has directed international surgical courses in Italy, 
Thank you for doing that. <laughs> India, <laughs> Germany, Switzerland, and Russia. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Greg Randolph. So, welcome uh, to our uh, ENT uh, welcoming kind of forum. And I am just so excited to tell you about otolaryngology and uh, have you consider otolaryngology. I still remember the day that they broke the rules and they called me on the phone. My mentor, who had interviewed me back then, not so many rules, called me on the phone. He says, I'm not really supposed to say this because it's all the match, but you're in. And I felt like I had won the lottery. I still know where I was sitting on the arm of the couch in Lasden House at Cornell when I got that call. I still remember how I felt being able to tell Lorraine, my wife, that I got in. It was amazing. And I just, it, there's good reason for that sense of winning a lottery by getting into an ENT residency because it's an amazing, amazing specialty. I want to thank a few people here. First and foremost, Greg, for his graciousness in allowing us to set up this program, this beginning of a national outreach to medical students to let you know what we are and to encourage you to the best possible career you could ever have as a surgeon and as a physician. Um, uh, the, um, there are a couple of other contributors that I wanted to mention that haven't been mentioned yet. Anand Dev Devanaya, uh, uh, Jan Grobaleski, Jess Levy, uh, Ellie Rabiz, who is in the back there, um, Rebecca Compton, Aaron Hauser, and Jen Harb all were really helpful in putting this evening together. Not so easy to get all this together. I also wanted to mention Elise Swinehart and Ross Rollins and give them a special... <laughs> that this program has gotten together and we really all appreciate it. So I want to just mention a little bit about the Academy. Uh, the Academy is the national grouping of otolaryngologists. The official term is the Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. This represents approximately 12,000 otolaryngologists from really all around the globe. There are about a thousand international members and there are about 54 international corresponding societies that have that are national otolaryngology groups that have relationships to the academy. So although the American Academy of Otolaryngology, it's really a global organization, all uh, with the goal of treating ear, nose, and throat uh, disorders. Um, and the purpose of today is really to focus on what is it, what can it be, what areas we work in, and uh, what are our days like? What are the surgeries that most excite us? What are our common failures? What are the problems we have during the day? What are our successes? So that you really get a sense of what it is like to be an otolaryngologist head and neck surgeon. And that's not an easy task because I'm still in the process of learning that because the head and neck otolaryngologist can do delicate skull base surgery can do no surgery at all and just do allergy in the office, can do large open neck, head and neck surgical procedures or endoscopic ear surgery, can do robotic surgery, can do thyroid and parathyroid <laughs> surgery, can do pediatric surgery, nasal and sinus surgery, sleep apnea surgery. And all of this is with the perverse pleasure of having whatever <laughs> operative field you're working in, some important cranial nerve ramify right through that surgical field. And so doing what you need to do and preserving that important vision, smell, taste, tongue motion, shoulder function, voice and swallowing functions is really the, the, the delight that we have to deal with. So basically, I wanted to mention a couple of things. In mentioning the academy, there is some academy functionality which may be very important for you. The academy has a new website that Elise will email you all about. Uh, there is a new $25 a year fee to join the academy as a medical student. And she just told me this evening there are 11 $500 uh, travel grants to facilitate going to the uh, annual meeting, which is the biggest, most gigantic 
confusing, delightful, amazingly large, enjoyable meeting that you will ever go to. This next one in September is in New Orleans. Um, so there's a lot of uh, 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 functionality that you'll see through that medical student webpage. Uh, and so joining the Academy, $25, is it's a worthwhile fee. I also want to mention that this conversation is just the beginning of a conversation that we would like to continue over time. And so all of our emails, all of the faculty's emails, I haven't actually asked the faculty this, but it's an <laughs> assumption on my part that all of their emails are, their office emails are shared with any of you so that if you said, hey, you know, you asked, uh, you said a certain thing about the application process and I was unclear about that, you can email them directly, me included, uh, to get this uh, added information. I wanted then next to just introduce the panel and I just wanted to ask first though, of the people that are here in the audience, we were wondering about the main area of interest uh, being just learning about otolaryngology and what it's all about, or more specific, like I think I'm already interested, but I want to know more about how to get through that, what is a competitive application process. So can I ask, of those whose primary interest is learning in general, they're not decided and they would like to learn more about it, can you raise your hands? Okay, okay, so, and then, how many are primarily like, I think I'm already good with otolaryngology, but I'm a little freaked out that it's so hard <laughs> to get into, which uh, uh, I would encourage you towards persevering and getting in. Uh, can you raise your hands? Okay, so it's almost a 50-50 split. So there's both of those needs. So I wanted to ask that so we could meet your needs better. So I want to introduce now the faculty, Michael Cohen. Can you raise your hand there? Mike is an attending at the Boston VA Medical Center and Boston Medical Center, assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at BU. He completed his residency at Boston Medical Center and now is an attending, uh, after attending medical school in the University of Pennsylvania. He practices as a general otolaryngologist, treating a full range of ENT disorders. And we'll get Mike to speak later on what does that mean? Like, <laughs> what do you actually do? What sort of surgeries do you do? Alessa Kalani is uh, a, a graduate of Duke. Alessa, would you raise your hand? And she has received her, a graduate of Duke University, received a degrees in biology and philosophy. She attended medical school at Johns Hopkins is currently and completed a master of philosophy in history and philosophy of science at the University of Cambridge as a Gates Cambridge scholar, focused her work on historical and sociologic factors contributing to culture surrounding end of life care in the US and the UK, and is currently one of our star residents at the Harvard program at Mass Ioneer. Walid Dagger, raise your hand please, is uh, with ENT specialists in 2015, uh, since 2015, and uh, uh, provides uh, general and comprehensive otolaryngology care in four offices outside of Boston in a group that comprises nine otolaryngologists, completing his degree at University of Beirut, Be Beirut and then went on to residency, otolaryngology residency at Tufts, and did a fellowship in rhinology in Baltimore. And so his subspecialty interest in rhinology and is certified in balloon sinuplasty, a specific technique within sinus surgery. Miriam, Miriam O'Leary is an assistant professor and the residency program director at Tufts Otolaryngology, graduated from University of Connecticut, completed an otolaryngology residency at Boston University, and has also, uh, subsequent to that residency, done a fellowship in head and neck cancer, ablative surgery, and microvascular reconstruction at University of Miami. He and Tierney uh, has been, he and would you is at been at Atrius Health, Atrius Health in since 2010. Uh, this is a nonprofit physician-run healthcare group of 800 clinicians in 50 specialties. Uh, she is completed her general surgical internship at Beth Israel Deaconess and her otolaryngology uh, fellowship at the Harvard Pro, uh, Otol otolaryngology residency at the Harvard program. She has received clinical training in endocrine surgery at the Mass Ioneer and has a practices a general otolaryngology practice for both adults and children, but with a specific interest in thyroid and parathyroid surgery, which she does expertly. 
excuse me for a little editorializing. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah Tracy uh, is a assistant professor in the University of Massachusetts Medical School, specializing in head and neck surgical oncology and microvascular reconstruction, completing a residency at Tufts Fellowship at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, after attending uh, medical school at Connecticut. Betty Yang is uh, originally from the California area. She completed undergraduate uh, studies at Berkeley, attended BU Medical School, and then a, uh, is currently a PGY-4 uh, in the Boston University Otolaryngology Residency Program. After residency, she plans to practice as a general comprehensive otolaryngologist. Lauren Tracy is an assistant professor of otolaryngology head and neck surgery, completed a residency at North Carolina, and a fellowship in laryngeal surgery at Mass General Hospital. Her clinical and research interests are centered around treating patients with voice disorders and early glottic vocal cord carcinoma. Stephanie Saunders. Stephanie is a general otolaryngologist at Leahy Hospital Medical Center. She completed her MD at Drexel University College and then completed her internship and residency uh, in otolaryngology at uh, Boston Medical Center. So an amazing group of people, amazing range, amazing diversity from trainees in different programs to senior people from private practice to academics, from laryngeal surgery to general laryngology to head and neck surgery, uh, really an amazing range. So what I wanted to do uh, first is really just to uh, start the questioning process. We have some questions that Elise actually worked on that gathered from you, and she kind of summated them into kind of what are the main areas of interest that you're most interested in. But I would encourage you, it's less important to me and to the panel that we get through this list of questions, more important that if you come up with a question that you feel is important, raise your hand, we'll stop, and we'll take that question, okay? So what I wanted to do first is just talk about, uh, first, I mean, it's cool anatomy and it's cool <laughs> surgery. I mean, that's what probably has brought all of you into this room. That's what brought me into the specialty. I was going to be, I'll admit it, don't say this to anybody, Greg, and no one else admit this, but I was going into OBGYN. It's true. It was what was going to happen. And then I went into my ENT rotation, and I learned about the anatomy of the middle ear, and I freaked out. And then I found out that there's a gland in the neck Going back to my OBGYN, I could forget about the corpus lutea and worry about the thyroid gland, and I had all that head and neck anatomy, and the gland, I thought I died and went to heaven. This is where I want to stay the rest of my life. And that was a third year in medical school, I decided that. So, but it's about the anatomy. I would say most would agree the anatomy and the school surgical procedures. So, Mike, Dr. Cohen, as a generalist, what what is, like, what's, a cool surgery that you do, and why do you like it? What is it? The anatomy? Is it the result? What's cool about the surgery? Give us one surgery that you really think is cool. Well, I think for me, one reason that I became a generalist is that it's really hard for me to pick just one surgery that I think is cool. Um, I didn't want to give up thyroid surgery. I didn't want to give up sinus surgery. I didn't want to give up pediatric surgery. Um, I mean, for me, my my favorite surgery still, and it's funny because this is probably from first year of medical school, one of the reasons I, when I was a first year medical student in anatomy, I remember spending forever dissecting the facial nerve, trying to do that in a cadaver through like, you know, a, a dog meat parotid gland because they don't preserve it all and staying after anatomy class was over and still trying to do it. And I still say that today, my favorite surgery to do is parotidectomy, um, you know, finding the facial nerve or, you know, watching, you know, ner very nervously as Dr. Yang finds the facial nerve um, <laughs> and then, you know, treat, um, which she does excellently. And, um, and just, you know, tracing out all the different branches and, you know, peeling a tumor out from between the branches is still probably my favorite surgery to do. Cool. So Jeremiah, uh, Dr. Tracy, what, I mean, as a head and neck surgeon, you're up to your knees in neck anatomy and oral cavities every day. What was it that initially said like this is this can be long surgery it can be complicated surgery it can be associated with complications this surgery it's a big burden to bear what was it that made you say this is where i want to live every day 
Um, yeah, so I think head and neck is a little different uh, than some of the other fields within otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. Um, primarily in that the surgeries tend to be very long. A lot of ENT cases are short. Um, and those patients have cancer, so a lot of them have real mortal problems. I think what attracted me to it was that acuity of care, um, taking care of people with those type of problems. Um, and I think uh, I found it rewarding to be able to see them and take them through that and, and hopefully see them on the other side of it and see them living their life and doing well. So you heard him say, you know, we, we're told you have to be a primary care physician to have a good relationship with a patient. You want to put that on the back burner. When you operate on someone, especially for a cancer, there is no closer relationship you can have with another human than that. You walk into the room and you start talking about how they're going to function postoperatively, and it is an incredibly tight uh, uh, relationship. And you may have that relationship carry on for several years, but even if, like for thyroid cancer patients, I refer the patient then to an endocrinologist, that relationship that I have with that patient is is amazingly tight, and it's very, 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 very gratifying. So, Alyssa, let me, let me ask you. You've had a wide range in training. What is it that pulled you into ENT? Was it a surgical procedure? Was it the anatomy, or was it something else that pulled you into this area? Um, so I'll uh, preface this by saying that I did my surgical rotation first because I was sure that I was never going to go into surgery, and I just wanted to get it out of the way. Um, but in that rotation, I spent a week on, um, an ENT service and I really liked the people that were there. Like I, I got along with the residents extremely well. They were like very knowledgeable, but very kind and, um, treated patients with just such respect and, um, clearly like enjoyed what they were doing. Um, I'm the first doctor in my family. I had no idea what ENT was. Um, and so after doing that, I did a month, um, just as an elective student to kind of learn a little bit more. And I was just so impressed by the breadth um, of the practice. So as Dr. Randolph had alluded to, there are just hundreds of ways to create your career within ENT. And so if you're somebody who loves the technical aspects of surgery, there's something for you here. If you're somebody who really likes physiology and really likes allergy, there's stuff for you here too. Um, and so as somebody who has always been a little bit afraid of closing doors, I was like, this is something that will open doors um, and uh, really is not going to pinhole me into doing one thing for my, the rest of my career. Um, so I'd say a combination of the people and the just wide variety um, and the real impact that you have on patients' lives. So, so much of our lives are lived above the clavicles and that's really where we live and work. Um, so I think that kind of encourages you to forge a very deep relationship with the patients that you see in clinic, operate on, see as consults. I, uh, I'm glad I'm here. Miriam, Dr. O'Leary, can I ask you, what was it that pulled you in? What was it? Was it the people? Was it the anatomy? Was it the surgery? What was it that did it for you? Combination of factors. I, I knew I wanted to go into a surgical field, and I'd say if I had to choose one word, it would be variety, because the, you have tremendous variety in the types of patients you see, from neonates to elderly people. A variety of different types of problems, although we are dealing with a small area of the body that affect most of the senses, um, you know, smell, taste, hearing, et cetera, um, and a variety of surgical techniques. So in the space of a week, I could be uh, putting plates and screws on a facial fracture. I could be doing open soft tissue neck surgery. I could be operating under a microscope. I could be using telescopes in the larynx or in the, the sinuses. So I just love that I am doing a variety of things throughout my week, and it's not the exact same thing day after day after day. So he and Dr. Tierney, let me ask you, what was it that pulled you in? And then also, you must tell us, why do you love thyroid surgery? <laughs> I, I only do thyroid surgery, so I would just assume only ask questions about thyroid, but uh, he and I think has a good bit of that. Some of the virus jumped off me and has now, she's a carrier for it too. So I think she can probably give as good an answer as I can about that. But but before that, you say, what was it that drew you into otolaryngology and, uh, in the first place? Yeah, so um, I was sort of like, unless I felt I knew I wasn't going to do anything surgical um, until I did my, in fact, my general surgery rotation and just loved being in the operating room. 
um, and figured I needed to look around at the subspecialties. Um, so, you know, looked at plastics and um, neurosurgery and ENT um, and, you know, sort of echoing what's been set up here. I think it's a, it's a really great variety of um, surgeries. And what I really liked as a student was that you could do a little bit of primary care. Um, so you follow a lot of patients over time who don't have necessarily acute patients, but who you develop strong relationship with. And that's something I knew I really wanted to do. I didn't want to just operate on somebody, see them at their post-op and then discharge them from my practice. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for that in our, in our specialty. So, um, and yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> Dr. Randolph, thanks for, uh, <laughs> um, shouting out for the thyroid. Um, but you know, I was just with, um, a student, uh, two weeks ago. And, you know, we have these days where we just do multiple thyroid surgeries. Um, and it'll be like right hemithyroid, right hemithyroid, right hemithyroid. So the same surgery. Um, and it's just so varied. I mean, every patient is so different, every gland, every nerve. Um, and it makes it interesting. It's, it's funny. I mean, it's, you do the same steps, every surgery for the most part, but you always learn something new. Um, and that makes it really fascinating. So. That's something that when you speak to people who've been doing it for a while, this kind of, she made a very interesting point, this idea of like, why would you possibly want to keep doing right hemithyroids? <laughs> but there's this like Japanese tea service kind of efficiency of motion. And I mean, Jen Brooks here is in the audience here. She's my fellow this year. The goal she and I both have, I love gabbing, as you can tell. I love talking <laughs> during the case. What do you think about that? Whoa, that's cool, isn't it? But the goal of the year is to finish a case at the end of the year without saying a word by just communicating because you know it should be pushed at that angle, not that angle. It should be pushed just a little bit so the tissue creases and then you'll see the parathyroid. That kind of communication through your and efficiency of motion is addictive. You will like it. And then in all of these cases, you know, you'll have in your clinic postoperatively, you'll see how you're getting better. The voice will be better. The calcium needs after thyroidectomy will be better. In other words, you see how you're getting better, and that is also addictive. Um, let me ask uh, Wallen, uh, Dr. Degger, the, what, what um, you know, some of these patients that we deal with can be difficult, and, uh, you know, smell, taste, voice, hearing, Sometimes things don't go as well as we like, and so some of these patients can be challenging and difficult. So can you describe a, a typical patient that recently that you had that was in some way difficult or a problematic and how you dealt with that? Absolutely. I mean, we see a lot of patients who, when you examine them, they have normal findings and you do the objective test, whether it's audiometric testing and whatnot, and everything is normal, yet the patient is still symptomatic. And I always tell the patients, you are the most difficult patient for me. It's much easier for me to tell you, you know, you have a cancer or you have a pathology rather than tell you, oh, everything is normal and you leave unhappy with, um, you know, with what I told you and, you know, try to shop for another doctor to try to find an answer. <clears throat> we deal with this, you know, on a daily basis, I think. Um, so these are challenging things that, you know, I think I find in my, in my practice on a day-to-day -day basis, just a normal patient that, you know, has a complaint. Stephanie, can I ask you with your practice, what is, what are the most commonly uh, encountered conditions and the most commonly performed surgeries? Realizing you do a range, but where is the, where is the center of it for you? So I work at um, Leahy Hospital, which is um, a semi-academic practice a little bit north of the city and affiliated with Boston University as well. Um, so being a general otolaryngologist in the practice of mostly subspecialists, is, it's a little bit of a different environment probably that Dr. Dagger sees at his office, where they probably he probably sees a lot more of things. Um, the things that get filtered into my clinic are really the general otolaryngology problems. I see a lot of people with sleep apnea, um, a lot of people with nasal obstruction. Um, tons of people have post-nasal drip that is just the most bothersome thing in the world <laughs> to them that we can't always fix that easily. Um, and so, I mean, I see a lot of hearing loss. I see a lot of the general stuff. Um, from time to time, I'll have other things come into the clinic um, that are maybe a little bit more interesting, but usually get filtered to my partners at that point. 
Um, I do a lot. A lot of the surgery that I do is sleep apnea and nasal surgery, um, as well as some sinus surgery. So I've been kind of building a practice in functional rhinoplasty, um, septoplasty, and I really do enjoy that. Um, my most kind of challenging case recently was actually a functional rhino that we reconstructed with the rib graft. So a lot of general otolaryngologists probably don't do that procedure very much, but with having a good training, I felt comfortable doing that. Um, and our patient had a great outcome and, you know, the sleep apnea was better. The nasal breathing was better. So it was, it was very rewarding. Betty, I just want to jump to a different thing. As a trainee, now you're exposed to a whole range of surgeries, ones that you may be interested in, ones that areas that you think, hmm, I'm not really going to be going into that area, but you're exposed to it anyway. So can you tell us what are the things that you've been exposed to and what are your tendencies now in terms of deciding, well, that's why I didn't like thyroid surgery and that's why I do like sinus surgery. Don't worry about offending anybody. You know, just tell us <laughs> because you got so many, you're going to offend somebody if you, I mean, so many, so many people different areas. But, um, so what have you been recently exposed to? Because I think it's, it's, it would be hard to the audience to appreciate everything that an ENT resident is exposed to in their various rotations. And uh, and what are, is your inclination now as to what you might favor? Um, so it's funny because one of the surgeries that got me interested in ENT was a free flap surgery. I thought it was so wild that you could take a leg and put it into the face and reconstruct the mandible. I thought that was amazing. Um, and I didn't know anything about ears and they were sort of still foreign to me up until probably just this past fall. <laughs> um, but one of the some of the surgeries that have been surprising to me that I think I do want to incorporate into my practice are some ear surgeries. Um, I think one of the most rewarding surgeries that I've done um, was a stapedectomy where I finally was, I had done all of the steps in the case and then you see the person back in clinic and the, the, the patient complained that he was hearing too well. And I was like, wow, well, all right. <laughs> is that, is everybody say. familiar with stapedectomy? Everybody know, you know, so otosclerosis is a process where the stapes becomes fixed. And so the conduction through the ossicles from the drum to the ossicles is in, is dampened. And so you basically, under the microscope, raise a flap, raise the eardrum like opening the porthole of a ship, look in through with a microscope, fracture the stapes from the incus. The otologists on the on the board need to correct me if I'm wrong because it's been a long time. It was one of my favorite surgeries during the residency though, even though I'm a thyroid surgeon. You take that baby out of there. <laughs> you leave the foot plate, which is fixed by the otosclerosis process. You drill with a laser or with a little handheld drill on opening a stapedotomy and then put a piston into the uh, inner ear through the stapedotomy and hook the coat hanger like wire to the long process of the incus and so reconstitute the acicular chain. Is that insane? <laughs> and then they hear better. And if you do it under local, they hear better the moment you crimp that baby onto the incus. It's insane. But that epitomizes this kind of structural, surgical, and functional cranial nerve vibe that we're talking about, which is really the juice that gets all these people up in the morning, right? That functionality and sweet anatomy. So let me ask uh, uh, Alessa, what, what was the same thing? You, As a resident, you're exposed to surgeries that you really are like, whoa, I'm going to be doing this. I really want to do this. And surgery is like, mm, not so much. So what surgeries have you been exposed to recently? And what are you thinking about in terms of with all of that to pick from, what direction might you go in? Um, so I just finished a rotation where I was doing uh, like endocrine, sinus, and laryngology surgery. So depending on what residency you go to, they kind of group things in different different ways. Um, so I just finished doing a ton of sinus surgery, um, which I have to admit as a PGY2, I did, I wasn't really all that into, I didn't really know how to hold the endoscope. I didn't know what I was looking at. It's kind of stressful. Uh, cause you know, you don't want to get into the eye or the brain. Those are two important structures. Um, but, uh, 
having gotten more reps and having done more of those surgeries, it's so much fun. And I was able to like take a medical student through. So anyway, that was a surprising thing that I didn't think that I was going to like, but I, I really like now. Um, I'm uh, applying for a fellowship this year uh, in um, head and neck uh, reconstructive surgery. Um, what I like about that are the patients. Um, I really like treating cancer uh, and I really like the kind of creative um, aspect of that because you're thinking about both what functional deficits a particular oncologic resection is going to leave and also how to best reconstruct that. And it's a really, we talk a lot about like shared decision-making in medicine. And I think that's one of the most um, exciting examples of shared decision-making because two people can present with the same disease and have totally different expectations, desires, um, uh, and uh, come out with very two very different surgeries um, or no surgery at all. So I wanted to jump a little bit. Um, I mean, I think what's, what surgery have you seen that's cool is a topic we could stay on for three weeks. So we can always jump back. And there's going to be at about 6.15 or so, there'll be sandwiches in the back. So we can continue talking up front. We can continue talking in the back. You can email us later. So this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of it. But I, I wanted a little bit jump like, so like, what do you mean private practice? Like, what is that? And what do you mean academics? Like, what is that? And having been in academics for my entire career, I don't know that I can give you a good answer myself. And I think the two things are kind of joining more than they're diverging. But I wanted to ask Lauren, Lauren, can you, can you give us a little sense of your perspective as to how you would advise these medical students? What is like a private practice type environment? And um, what is an academic kind of environment? as best as you perceive it. Sure. Well, I might defer to some of the private practitioners on what yeah. is a private practice uh, environment, but certainly, you know, um, in terms of an academic environment, all residencies are done at an academic environment. Um, and I tend to think of them as being a more tertiary care where you're seeing higher level of care or higher level of acuity of patients who are referred in from um, outside hospitals. Um, uh, there's often many uh, practitioners in all the different specialties. So you have all of your rhinologists, your laryngologists, head and neck surgeons, otologists, facial plastic surgeons, and generalists. Um, one of the reasons why I chose to go into the academic practice is that you do have the opportunity to teach and work with the residents. And I do think that's available in a number of private practices as well. Um, but also one of the things that I enjoy about being in an academic practice is the opportunity for collaboration um, with amongst all of the different other uh, practices within Boston Medical Center. So we often work with the thoracic surgeons or the gastrointestinal or the GI yeah. doctors. Um, and we also have you know, a cadre of uh, speech language pathologists and audiologists. So it tends to just be maybe a broader, bigger group of people in practice seeing a more higher acuity level of patients. And I would like anyone to weigh in on the private practice sector. Well, and could you maybe give us a little synopsis of your perception of what a private practice, non-academic environment would be? So absolutely. D during uh, your residency, you're not really exposed to what happens in private practice, so you know how academics work. Um, so I joined the private practice group. Our group is a little bit different than other private practices in that we have a full-time resident from Tufts, usually a senior resident rotating with us. So, um, you know, you have to understand the finances of medicine quite a bit, which was something that we were not exposed to during our training. And then you get the, the reality shock once you start, you know, your practice that, you know, you have to think about everything. And I think it carries some headache that, you know, it's not an academic uh, place where you are at. So you, you don't have to worry about finances that much because now it affects you personally, you know. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you always have to keep you know, meeting certain quotas and then you have to deal with employees um, yourself, whereas in an academic position, um, you know, this is something that the hospital takes care of. Um, and, you know, I, I think some students here may think that, oh, private practice, the, the level of uh, uh, surgical cases that you do is you know, slightly easier than, yeah, that's, that's right, because the resources are a little bit, uh, you know, less than what we have in academic positions, but, you know, it all depends on what you want to do. 
I personally, um, like uh, Mike mentioned, he didn't want to corner himself into doing, you know, only uh, bread and butter cases. So we, uh, I keep on doing uh, head and neck cases, uh, sinus cases, autology cases, and stapedectomy is one of my favorite cases uh, to do as well. Uh, so, I mean, from the private practice standpoint, you you guys have to um, be aware of the financial situation. Um, relative to, you know, what needs to be done a little bit different than in uh, academic medicine. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to jump a little bit to another topic, which is a big topic now is that, you know, we, we've we always thought, well, we're supermen and superwomen and we can just, you know, eat 18 hour days and chew them up and spit them out. And then we realize hmm, that's not really working out so good. So like work life balance and how to keep ourselves healthy is part of the vibe of certainly of otolaryngology and you heard one of the underpinnings of of uh, not only the anatomy the cool surgery the functionality of the head and neck but at least for me just as Alyssa had said that when I did different rotations I was thinking as I said OBGYN I was even thinking neurosurgery at one point I was thinking general surgery at one point and when I met the otolaryngologist I thought whoa these are nice people they're they're <laughs> pleasant. They're working hard. The surgeries are very complex, but they seem happy about it. They're not pissed off. They're not angry. And they're legitimate moral people. And that's exactly what I thought when I first walked into the Iron Era, the Cornell medical student in 1987. I met Michael McKenna and Ralph Iannuzzi, the two of the mentors of the people here on the panel. And I thought, God, these guys are hilarious smart as bastards, working hard, and they gave me the time of day and chatted me up a little bit and encouraged me like, hey, yeah, Greg, you should really do this, you know? Not like dissed me and, and were negative and all frumpy and stuff. So that, and then it turns out my, my nephew is now a medical student in Florida and was interested in orthopedic surgery. And he goes, he called me up, he goes, Uncle Greg, I just rotated with ENT. These guys are friendly. They gave me the time of day. They really were working hard. The cases are long and difficult, but they gave me the time of day and they seem fairly happy about the whole thing. He goes, I, I'm thinking about ENT. I said, you know, it's funny. 25 years ago, I had the same exact thoughts as you. So that kind of sense of the community that you're doing. I mean, look at the community. We've invited you here to teach us, to let you know about what we are and to invite you in. It's really like a community. It's legit, you know. That's what's pulled many of us in. So let me just switch to that that work-life balance a little bit because that's important. I think the people that go into otolaryngology have that as a priority. Uh, they want to be happy. They are generally happy. But he and let me ask you. I mean, as a woman, especially, I think the burdens that you have earlier on in career are significant and different and many would say more difficult to manage as you st leave residency and start a practice because of the family responsibilities that are let's face it no matter how you dice it not evenly distributed male to female that's just not the way it typically is so how would you how do you what do you think about work life balance how do you how have you managed that with all of your various responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a challenge. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a general otolaryngologist in private practice. So luckily I have a lot of control over my schedule. Um, I have three children, which I had after residency. Um, and basically I just had to adjust my schedule accordingly. Um, but it's a constant challenge. I mean, I, I'm not gonna say, I think that everybody in our specialty must um, struggle with this a little bit. Um, I think it's just about being organized and proactive and, you know, you have to communicate with your team um, about what you need. Um, but it's, it's, it's challenging. I'm lucky to be in a practice where I have a lot of control. Um, and most of our patients do well um, and are relatively healthy, which also makes it really um, nice. Um, and so, you know, there's always going to be the emergency, the long case, the difficult case, the complications that you can't plan for. 
Um, and so that's, I think, the nature of any surgical specialty or medical specialty. But um, I think we have a specialty where it is possible to have it all um, and to do complex cases and be very involved, um, to do teaching, to do research if you want to, to have a family. Um, I think it is possible. Um, it's, you know, but it just takes organization and, and, and you know, um, really working to have that balance. So um, it's constant work. Lauren, what would you say about this same question? Um, so this, I'm a first year attending at Boston Medical Center. And what I would say is I never, I, mean, I never worked as hard as I did during my residency. <laughs> so that was, you know, 80 to 100 hour weeks, you know, not sleeping, 80 hour weeks, um, you know, not sleeping for 48 it's only hours. 80. It's not 80. even ever 81. It's only 80. You, you said 80. Yeah, right? like I said. It's only 80. It's always only 80. It's never more than 80. Go ahead, Lauren. So, um, so then for my fellowship and now being an attending, you know, that trains you very well to, um, I guess, I guess prioritize your other, um, things in your life. And so now that I am attending, I do certainly do have more free time. Um, I do not have any children. So right now it's just focusing, you know, on my research and my career and my um, marriage so that everything gets better after residency. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah, uh, you know, it, you know the, these burdens and this balance of work and life is not solely a female. I mean, we all have difficulties in managing this and Sometimes I think it's our own ambition that is our worst enemy. For me, that is certainly the case. So, Jeremy, what would you say about how you balance the head and neck surgeries, as you all know, can be very long and grueling. And so there aren't typically easy days in the OR. And so to deal with that and then come home and be nice to your wife and kids and so forth can be, you know, a little bit of a, you got to think on your way home, I'm driving home, I'm going to be at my house now, and I'm going to have kids around me, and I don't have that bleeding jugular vein anymore, so I got to <laughs> calm down a little bit. How do you deal with that, Jeremy? So um, I think that, I think ENT probably does have a better work-life balance than other surgical fields, mm -hmm. but I think we have to be honest that it is a surgical field, um, and surgeons work hard. So I think um, the way you deal with it is that you have to like it. You know, um, I, I love what I do, and so um, if I see a uh, resident calling me whatever, whenever it is in the middle of the night or the weekend, I want to know what's going on. So I pick up and it, it doesn't feel like a burden, you know. Yeah. That's a good, I actually was just thinking that in the office because I, my, my, um, my secretary will come to the door and knock on the door and say, physician calling on line seven. That means you got to stop talking to this patient because they're backed <laughs> up in the clinic here. You know, that's her little side. Of me. So I do that because I love talking to patients and I would just as soon talk to them about and if they ask me like well why should I do that why shouldn't I take the whole thought out I'm like all right so let's talk about that that's a cool question let's go so loving what you do a lot of things get better when that's the recipe and you see here these testimonials are are like not prefab they're all legit like they love what they do so you should join us you know in that so anyway uh, I wanted to just jump to one other topic to kind of try and move around a little bit. I just assume talk about cool surgeries the whole time, and we can do that when we eat. But um, but I wanted to ask uh, Mike, uh, the field is like really rapidly changes. Technology, some new technology collides with our normal clinical practice every six months or so, a new harmonic device or a new telescope or a new three chip camera or some other procedure of way to do something. How, what, can you comment on something that you've observed that has changed from your training to your work now, uh, something that's changed or uh, emphasizes how important that change is in our practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that if you, if you like technology and you like gadgets, that ENT is really one of the best fields. I think it's probably the only field where you can do a surgery with a robot holding a laser. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, so for me, one of my, as a generalist, one of my clinical interests is sleep apnea. And, you know, and really recently, you know, within the last three years, they've developed, you know, hypoglossal nerve stimulators, which are implants that are placed on the hypoglossal nerve uh, to help people with sleep apnea to sort of help open their airway more when they're asleep. And, 
this is a surgery that you know I'm now starting to do. And I think one of the beauties of ENT is you're always learning new surgeries. And I mean, you you can keep doing the same surgeries you learn to do in your training and um and do them the same way, but you're gonna kind of you know fall by the wayside. And one of you know, my mentors during my residency here at Boston Medical was um uh, was Jeff Spiegel, who's one of our plastic surgeons, who his specialty is uh, facial feminization surgery for transgender patients. And this is based on he taught himself. He was one of, based on one of the first people to do this. And I think that ENT, just because it's such a you know collaborative field, it's really easy to kind of learn these new things. And I reached out to you know ENTs at at other places at you know uh, in Boston, but also in other cities who are starting to do these, who have been doing these nerve simulators longer. And they'll say, oh, come spend the day with me and, you know, and watch how to do this. And just everyone in this field is so interested in kind of helping each other that it's a great field to kind of always learn about all these new things. So you heard just there, you heard you can do facial plastics, specifically transgender specific facial plastics, or you can put hypoglossal nerve stimulators on the hypoglossal nerve to stimulate specifically the subset of fibers, the branch of the hypoglossal nerve, that provides tongue protrusion, opening up the hypopharynx to improve sleep apnea. That's all within one specialty. Let me just ask one other question now also. I want to kind of make sure that of the questions that you've submitted, we've kind of gone through a survey, and we can certainly open it up when we uh, stop and eat uh, and continue the conversation. But Miriam, I wanted to ask you that one of the pleasures, at least in, in my life, is that I deal with endocrinologists. And you might say to deal with someone who is referring you patients and specifying the type of surgery that you do would be kind of cumbersome and, and bothersome. But I find the conversation between the endocrinologist and myself to be very, very positive. I, I like being a member of a team, even though I'm fairly sure of what to do myself. All surgeons are pretty sure about what they should do in every circumstance, but that's kind of how you have the willingness to kind of get into the OR every day is that you know what you have to do. But this idea of interacting with a team is surprisingly pleasurable, and we have now increasingly and will in the future have PA students and PAs and nurse practitioners and other uh uh, caregivers that will be part of a team. It's already, I think Jeremiah mentioned about the, uh, or Laura about the uh, speech therapist, the audiologist. The, we have a lot of professional uh, staff that allow us uh, the functionality of the of the otolaryngologist as part of a, a team. Can you comment on how you fit into the team that you work with and how these other physicians and other non-physicians kind of provide a broader front of your activity? Yeah, well, certainly um, with head and neck cancer, it, it takes a village. Um, and uh, so you're involved with radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, speech language pathologists, oral maxillofacial surgery sometimes, and, you know, can go even further afield, nutritionists. Um, so uh, you all have a, a, a piece to contribute to the puzzle. The thing I like about head and neck cancer is that the um, the head and neck surgeon is sort of the captain of the ship in most cases, um, whereas in other types of cancer, it may be really the medical oncologist who drives the care primarily. But uh, we are the ones who can examine all the subsites uh, where these cancers happen. So we tend to be the ones that follow them over time. Um, but I don't have the expertise of a medical oncologist or radiation oncologist. So to work together as a team to manage these patients um, is, is very gratifying. And certainly when when the cases are difficult, it, it's very helpful to have the input and support of, of multiple other uh, uh, folks taking care of, of a complex patient. Um, and in terms of other surgeons that we work with, um, neurosurgeons, thoracic surgeons, we get referrals from most surgeons. Um, you know, there's a lot of overlap. Oral maxillofacial surgery, that's a lot of fun too, um, to get in the OR with somebody who comes from a slightly different expertise and to think together about a problem and, and, and approach it together. Um, it's a very gratifying thing to do. So I'm going to jump again because I want to make sure that the people who are already interested in otolaryngology are fairly sure, but getting increasingly freaked out that, oh my God, it sounds like it's so competitive. How do you how do you optimize your application? What advice do you have? And that may come a little bit more offline with any of us, especially Alyssa and Betty, to to ask you know the, those closest to the process how you 
maybe optimize your chance or what sage advice they've had how to get a little better leg up on things. So Betty, I want to ask you, what what would you advise you being successful in this research, in this um, in the residency process? What what would you advise as to uh, what do you think is important that you think the residency admission committees are really looking for? What distinguish you? What's your experience? Um, it's funny that you ask me. Um, I actually came to ENT pretty late. Um, I was considering general surgery very seriously. And um, in at BU before, you weren't um, able to rotate on subspecialties until your fourth year. Um, and so it was at the beginning of my fourth year that I discovered ENT. So I um, was nervous, as many of you might be, about being able to match having discovered it pretty late. <laughs> Um, thankfully I had a really supportive department. Um, but the advice I would give now, having seen other med students go through it, uh, cause I had classmates, um, who, who decided earlier on, you can certainly boost your application with research. Um, some of my classmates that I started medical school with decided to take a year off specifically so that they could become more competitive for ENT. Um, you know, it's, one of my program directors says it's one year of your life for the rest of your life. You know, it's some people think that it's a big commitment to take a year off and not finish on time. But um, if if you want to do this, then it is worth it. And the, the friends that I have who've done it made or feel like it is definitely worth it. Um, when I was uh, interviewing, I noticed because I wasn't able to um, to secure an away rotation because I had discovered it so late. I saw that other people who were going into rooms were being greeted very excitedly by the people that they had worked with on their away rotation. And I was like, oh, darn, I wish I'd made that connection. <laughs> um, so I definitely think away rotations are important. Um, um, I think those are the two things that are definitely... Well, Alyssa, what would you cut. say about uh, your experiences? What do you think facilitates uh, getting to the top of the heap there and and what pieces of the application are important? Um, so I think, uh, I agree with Betty. I think that doing, a, I didn't do an away rotation either and I had that exact same, like I was like, <laughs> oh, we all know each other. <laughs> um, Keep in mind, they're both here, right? <laughs> so apparently their sensation during the interview was not uh, on target, but they got here anyway. But. Um, I think... Uh, you know, research is important. Um, I, I come to this from like a slightly different background. So I didn't really do any otolaryngology specific research during medical school. I did all this like end of life palliative care, like thinking about history and philosophy. And I was really worried actually um, when I was applying that I hadn't done anything uh, that really demonstrated an interest in otolaryngology. Um, but I actually think that ended up being a strength just because you, uh, you know, uh, if you're really interested in something and you can, um, speak about it and get other people interested in it. Um, I think we come from a specialty that is generally curious and generally like wants to know more um, about anything. Um, and so uh, I think if you have a genuine passion for something, that's more important than making it fit into a particular box. Um, so I guess I would just encourage everybody to like find the thing that makes you excited about research or about inquiry or about taking care of patients and um, commit some good time and thought to it. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the project is. It matters like that you learn something from it, that you can speak in an excited fashion about it, that you're genuinely interested. Like nothing comes across more quickly than somebody who's genuinely interested in something that they're talking about. Um, I think those that would be my my advice. Great. So I wanted to now, we have a couple of minutes where we can keep going on and also open up for food. So it's not like you have to stop talking and then eat so we can eat and talk at the same time, um, as long as we do it carefully. Um, <laughs> but, but I, um, <clears throat> I want to open up the, we've covered the main topics that you had submitted that Elise had kindly uh, codified to the different subject areas. We've covered that in a very preliminary, perfunctory way. But uh, I'd like to open it up if anyone has questions. We have a few minutes. And then uh, after that, we can go ahead and open up the food. Any questions about anything? Don't be shy now. Yes. <coughs> 
So maybe Jeremiah and then Miriam could speak to that about how do you manage uh, patients that may be having complications in the days after their surgery that may require your attention and maybe even additional operative intervention, and yet you've got a day full of clinic scheduled. How do you manage that? Miriam, would you maybe start, and then we can have Jeremiah. <clears throat> um, it can be a challenge. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, most of the time things happen in a pretty predictable fashion, but sometimes you just have to blow up a clinic and deal with the situation <laughs> at hand, and it happens occasionally. Um, you have to be flexible. You have, I, I think you learn that in, in residency early on, adapt to the situation at hand, and um, in terms of the work-life balance, having an understanding partner at home uh, and help uh, is critical. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it, it, there's no question that sometimes it, it can be uh, it can be a challenge, and you can have a frustrating day. But uh, you get through it, get to the other side of it, and, and move on. So, having been a resident rounding on Dr. O'Leary's patients, I can feel, <laughs> uh, I think I can feel just pragmatically. I don't know if your first and second years. Um, this is why surgical residents do have to get up early because clinics, ORs typically start at 7.30. Clinics would start depending 7.30 to 8.30, depending on where you are. And so you have to get in early, you round on the patients, uh, you do a quick physical exam on all of them. Uh, you have to know about all their labs, all their ins and outs, and then you call your attendings and you get a plan for the day and have to get those orders instituted before you go to your assignment. Um, so you get in early, you touch base. And that's why I was saying, um, getting a phone call from the residents when I get up at at 6 or 6.30, and I know they're rounding, and they're going to text me or call me at 6.30. I'm, like, looking for that text. I want to see how the patients are doing. Um, but so that's what, you're, that's what life is like as a resident. Can I just ask also, and I don't mean to interrupt your stream of questions, and I'd like to have a few others, but is there anything else? These panelists are really dedicated to the specialty and dedicated to you and sharing information. So I just want to make sure, is there anything else that any of you would like to say about the specialty or about this, please. Uh, just as a residency program director, I would encourage you to come talk to a mentor relatively early on if you think you're interested in laryngology. If you ha are at an institution that has a residency, speaking to the residency program director is helpful. Uh, if you're at Brown, talking to Dr. Grableski or one of his colleagues. If you're at UMass, talking to Dr. Tracy, male Dr. Tracy or one of his <laughs> colleagues. Um, because, uh, the application process and the preparation is, um, a little, uh, unique in some ways relative to other specialties and your deans are good mentors, but they're not going to know all the specific ins and outs. So come talk to us early, particularly if you're concerned about your competitiveness as an applicant. Um, we can, we can advise you, we can get you hooked in with the right resources. Any other questions now from, from you folks? So Elise, do you want to go ahead? Shall we go ahead and open up the food then and we can continue the discussion just one-to-one -one or as groups? There's a bunch of sandwiches and really good food there, so please go ahead and make yourself. And thank you very much for the